Hi everyone, in this presentation I'm going to give a brief overview of what spectral cytometry is and two issues that come up frequently when running experiments on our spectral cytometer, which is also called the aurora. To start out, I want to point out the main difference between conventional and spectral cytometry. Mainly it has to do with how the detectors are utilized. In conventional cytometry, one detector is assigned to one fluorophore. So in this spectral viewer here, the rectangle shows the detectors and the curves show the emission spectra for these four different fluorophores. You can see that we're not actually picking up the full emission spectra for each fluorophore. With spectral cytometry, we utilize all of the detectors in the instrument to look at all of the fluorophores so that we define the fluorophores by a distinct signature. This is what this plot is showing here. Another big difference between these is the number of detectors. So our spectral cytometer has 64 detectors, whereas our conventional cytometers, for example, the Fortessa X20, has 18 detectors. So let's talk a little bit more about these signature plots. To read these signature plots, you need to know that these plots are essentially a summary of 64 individual histograms. So we just look at the single histogram over here, we have compensation beads stained with a single fluorophore. We have a positive population, a negative population, and the intensity is shown on the x-axis. If we flip this so that the intensity is now shown on the y-axis, and then if you can imagine just gating on the positive population, this is now what these spectral plots are showing. So intensity on the y-axis, each of these columns is one detector, and then the heat map basically shows you what the histogram is showing. So the plots are divided by laser. There are detectors associated with each laser. I know it's a little bit hard to read, but the UV laser has 16 detectors. So UV1 to UV16. Violet also has 16, so V1 to V16. Blue has 14 detectors, yellow green has 10 detectors, red has eight. So a total of 64 detectors that we're looking at. You can see that each of these three fluorophores has a very distinct signature. So the more distinct the signature, the easier it is, easier it is to separate these fluorophores. These single stains are essentially our reference controls, which are very important for our experiments. You're probably going to hear this term reference control quite a bit. Reference controls are very comparable to compensation controls. They are a single stain control that defines the fluorophore signature and they are important for unmixing the data. So first, when you're running the experiment, you're going to get raw data. So that's what I just showed you. These are FCS files that can be opened in Flojo or FCS Express, whatever application you're used to using. Um, if you are to open them, you'll see that the parameters are just the 64 detectors on the instrument. This data then goes through the unmixing algorithm, and then you'll get a second FCS file, which contains the unmixed data. This is what you're used to looking at, where the parameters are the fluorochromes included in the assay. Another difference between these two data sets is that raw data can be unmixed as many times as you want, whereas unmixed data cannot be used to unmix again. So just keep in mind that in the long term, you're definitely going to want to keep both FCS files. Another note is that unmixing cannot be done manually. So compensation can be either calculated by a computer or you can manually calculate the compensation. Um, unmixing, on the other hand, is a bit complicated, so it has to go through the algorithm. Okay, on to the common concerns. So these two concerns are something that I ask all of my users to always be looking for. The first has to do with unmixing. Just like once you run an experiment on a conventional cytometer, you want to check the compensation and make, that, make sure that's correct before you analyze it. You also want to check the unmixing on spectral data before you start analyzing your data. So if the unmixing is incorrect, you're going to end up with some data that looks a little bit odd. If you're really not careful, you could potentially get a false positive. And all of this has to do with the reference controls. So if you have better reference controls, you're going to get better unmixing. 
The second issue has to do with resolving the population. So if someone's unable to resolve to gate on their population of interest, the most obvious cause for that has to do with panel design. So if you rearrange the panel, then you should be able to get better results. Okay, let's talk about the unmixing a bit further. The unmixing errors are pretty easy to find, um, especially if you're looking at single stain samples. Basically, you can just use your prior knowledge about flow cytometry. If something looks odd to you, then there is probably something wrong. But to be specific, you're going to want to look at the negative populations. On the left here, you can see that these were unmixed correctly. So the negative populations are nice and round. There aren't any events that are extremely negative. On the right, however, you can see that there's these extremes over here and here. Sometimes they might be a little bit more diffuse looking. All of these plots have extreme negatives. Patterns are a bit odd. This data does not look great. Um, so in this case, there's probably something going on with the unmixing. You'd want to go back and check it and make sure that everything looks great before you go ahead and analyze this data. There is one pattern that you may not be used to that is somewhat expected in spectral data. If you are seeing that your negative population has a diagonal like this, this diagonal indicates that the floor fours on the two axes are very similar to each other. So if we have super bright 436 versus BV421 or super bright 436 versus E4450, these floor fours are extremely, extremely similar to each other. You cannot separate them on a conventional cytometer. So in this scenario, this diagonal pattern is actually expected. I know that it's not pretty. I would not recommend designing your panel. So this is a very critical plot that you would want to publish, um, but this is going to happen. However, if you see this on fluorophores that are not similar, so here we have PE Psi 7 versus APC Psi 7, BV421 versus BV786, there's something going on here. We would need to dig into the data further to figure out how to fix that. Now, in the long term to fix the errors, as I mentioned, if you have better reference controls, you'll get better unmixing. So if you keep on running into problems, you might need to think about how are the reference controls being created. But if you are finding that there are only some slight unmixing errors, it is possible to apply compensation to the unmixed data to fix it. So you would check unmixing the exact same way that you would check compensation. You're going to look at your single stains, all of the n by n plot combinations. You're going to hope that you can find um, or hope that you can draw a straight line between the negative, the middle of the negative population and the middle of the positive population. Um, that would mean that unmixing is correct. So this plot here, you can see that it looks like it's slightly overcompensated. In spectral terms, we would say this is slightly overcorrected. If you apply some negative compensation to this to move this positive population so it's in line with the negative population, that is perfectly acceptable to do and you could move forward with the data analysis. If you're seeing some patterns that are a little bit more odd like this one um, and you're having trouble applying a single compensation value to fix everything that's going on, this is when you're going to have to go back to the reference controls, maybe even rerun reference controls in order to fix these issues. The final note about unmixing errors has to do with compensation. So there's one, or compensation beads, there is one big issue with using only compensation beads as reference controls that I would like to make you aware of. The problem is if someone comes to me saying that their data looks weird, they're finding unmixing errors, in almost all cases, in order to correct those errors, I'm going to need single stain cells to do it. If someone has only run single stain compensation beads and they don't have single stain cells for the panel that they've run, then most likely they're going to get on mixing errors and I can't fix the errors. The reason for this has to do with the fact that sometimes the fluorophore signature on the beads is different than the fluorophore signature on the cells and the mismatch in the signature leads to unmixing errors. So this is what they, these plots here are showing. On the top here, we have compensation beads stained with BV711. On the bottom, we have cells stained with the same exact antibody. All of this data uh, is unmixed using 
the beads as the reference control. So if we check to see if the unmixing is correct, we can see that the beads unmix the beads correctly, but the beads did not correct or unmix the cells correctly. So there's a slight overcorrection here and a more significant overcorrection here. What I recommend people do is they run at least one experiment where they have a full set of compensation beads and a full set of cells to determine if beads can be used and which fluorophores are okay to use. There isn't really a way to predict this mismatch, unfortunately. Um, I can tell you some fluorophores are more likely to cause issues, but really the best way to go about it is to test your entire panel. And it's not like you have to run a double set of compensation con or reference controls every single experiment, but I would recommend doing it for one experiment. So moving on to the second issue, which has to do with spreading error and marker resolution. Before we get into this, I just want to make sure you know what I'm talking about when I say spreading error. So you've probably seen this in data before. It does happen in conventional cytometry. Um, so just to explain it, I'm going to use conventional cytometry as an example. We have a plot of uncompensated data here. Once we apply compensation, we would think that our data is probably going to look something like this. But in reality, we see a spreading error like this. So instead of this nice, tight, positive population, we're seeing a lot more variability in the intensity of our positive population. There's various reasons as to why this occurs, which I can explain at a later time. Um, but you're probably going to notice this a bit more in spectral cytometry, especially with the size of panels that people are running. And how you'll notice it is if you look at the single stain control, you can see this example, we have BB785. Um, there's a positive population, a negative population. We can definitely distinguish the two. Whereas once we add in the remaining colors within this panel, we've now lost our positive population. We can't get on this anymore. So this means that there's another fluorophore in this panel that is leading to, it's spreading into BB785 and causing us to lose the resolution. So what I ask users to do is a quality check on every panel that they run on the instrument. So the best way to do this is option one. Um, that's what I just showed you. Basically, you're going to compare the single stains to the multicolor stain, determine if there's any difference in resolution. Another way to do this panel check would be to compare a smaller fraction to the entire panel. So let's say you have a 24 color panel. You could stain one tube with 24 markers and another tube with 12 of those 24 markers and then gate both tubes and see if you can still find all of your populations of interest. I recommend running both options, but really I think option one is the most important one and it's especially important to do these quality checks on panels if you have a difficult panel. By difficult, I mean larger than 20 markers or, you know, it's kind of a rough estimate, but basically a large panel, uh, and or having a lot of co-express markers. If you have a panel that, let's say, only looks at T-cells and a lot of markers on those T-cells, then I would strongly recommend running a quality check. If you do find issues with the panel, then really the only way to fix that is to rearrange the panel. To summarize, the steps that I recommend for running a large panel, first design the panel using the Aurora specific tools, which I tell everyone in our training session. Um, the second step would be to definitely titrate the antibodies and the viability dye. Then you're going to want to perform a quality check on the panel to determine how well the panel was designed and assess if you need to rearrange any of it. Then you're also going to want to run that experiment where you compare the compensation beads and cells for your reference controls and determine um, which ones should be used to properly unmix the sample. Usually it's a combination of beads and cells that's going to give you the best unmixing results. And then finally you can run your experiment. If you have any questions about spectral cytometry, um, there's a lot more information that I can tell you about this. Feel free to schedule a meeting to talk with me, or if you would like, I can come to your lab meeting and tailor a 
seminar that goes over any topics relating to this. So if you just want a um, more detailed overview of spectral cytometry, or you want me to go over how to troubleshoot things, how to do panel design, etc., cetera, um, we can work something out. Also, just so you're aware, for your researchers, I do offer consultations. They're $35 an hour, and we do waive the fee for the first two hours if it's an Aurora project. Or I can also help with any other flow cytometry projects you may have. And then finally, um, we do have a website with a resources page, and I've been trying to upload a lot of information on there, so feel free to check that out as well.